Hi, everyone. It's Mary Larson of the NAM Foundation, and we're so glad to have you here at Believe in Music. We really hope you're having a remarkable time. I know there's lots of uh, shoot, shoots and alleys and streets and alleys and shoots and ladders at Believe in Music, and we hope you're exper experiencing them and exploring them and finding uh, new people to meet to strengthen your musical journey and your musical connections. So great to have you. I'm here to introduce and to share some time with a remarkable artist uh, who's going to, and a, two remarkable artists actually, that are going to be taking us through a conversation about the creative process and composition. This is called The Golden Brick with Eric Whitaker and Imogene Heap. And I'd love to uh, welcome Eric Whitaker to the screen. Hi, Eric. Hey, Mary. How are you doing? Good. There you are in your pristine studio looking so. Um, as most folks know, I hope you all know, Eric is a well-known, uh, beloved composer, conductor, uh, madman of virtual choirs. <laughs> <laughs> really mad. Uh, that kind of bro has broken the internet multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, uh, is a remarkable clinician, choral choral conductor, clinician, orchestral conductor. Um, you know, just sort of way out there on the edge of creativity, Eric. Welcome to Believe in Music. So Thank great to have you. you. I want your introduction to follow me wherever I go. I sound I, will. I, I can do that for you, you know. <laughs> I can record that for you. It'll be with you forever. <laughs> Eric, I, I met you, um, you know, most significantly uh, when you were involved with a project with NASA. Yeah. And unfortunately, Space Force or something got in the way of of you being able to go into orbit, pun intended, <laughs> with that project. Um, but you've really been way out on the edge of quite a few wild creative ideas for a, a while now, right? Yeah, it's, um, you, you know, it's funny. I, I feel that I'm a musician first and foremost. You know, my brain is just built to make music. I was born that way, I think. But I have this insatiable curiosity really about everything. And so uh, in that case, space, in some parallel universe where I'm good at math, I'm an astrophysicist. That's, that's the other career that I had. And each piece that I compose is, it's, it's a way for me to fall into this other discipline, to, to come at it from the inside out. And, and that piece with NASA was, uh, it was a dream come true because not only was I, I writing about space and, and the Hubble telescope, but I was meeting actual astronauts and engineers and and spent a lot of time at the Kennedy Space Center. So mm. in some ways it was just me using music as a vehicle to to nerd out. <laughs> Good for you. And then you composed Deep Field, which we actually uh screened at the NAM show, I think two years ago. That's it right. was just after we after we did a great um, audience participation sing along with you and uh you know, we had to get security to make sure you get out of the room all right. We have, <laughs> you have, I mean, really, you, uh, it's remarkable the gifts that you've given to the world and people, you know, really relate to you and they really feel strongly that you're um, giving them a lot, you know, by, through your music. And so, so that all leads me to the fact that um, I'm going to back out of the room here and you're going to be helping everyone to understand the essence of some creativity. And then a lot after that, and when we, we all get, uh, and I'm looking forward to that because after all this believe in music preparation, I need that reminder that I still can be creative. Um, uh, the um, you and Imogene Heap, the remarkable artist and innovative um, technology interfacer, Right. I mean, we're doing I'm like heroes, uh, personally also as a songwriter, as a, as an inventor, as, mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur. Yeah. She's, she's really one of my personal heroes. And then you're going to come on screen together and you're actually going to create in real time. That's right. Yeah. I'll, and, I'll four notes and, and, uh, and watch her do her thing. And allow us into what is normally a very, Got a kind of closed loop process, you know, so that's good. Great. And then we'll come back at the end. And after all of our heads are kind of blown, um, we'll ask you some wrap up questions that will help us uh, maybe integrate some of these ideas back into our own work. So take it away, Eric. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much. 
for the longest time, I had this idea of creativity that was the movie version of creativity. This sense that, you know, a composer or a songwriter is alone with their thoughts. And then suddenly this lightning bolt comes down. Uh, it's this immortal fire and, and inspiration is, it fills the soul and the music just pours out. I can say now I've been composing for 30 years and I've had maybe one or two experiences like that. One was a piece called Water Night that just flooded out of me, no pun intended. Uh, and and there's, there's no rhyme or reason for it, but I can definitely say that after a whole career of doing this, that is really a rare thing. And after talking to countless composers and songwriters, that rarely ever happens. The thing that actually happens is, is alone and tearing your hair out and trying to just put two notes together and nope, and throwing that away and two more notes and nope, and, and then finally a little inspiration and a victory. And then it, it's this very messy, messy process. And what I came to realize over the years as I was composing is there's, there's a method to, to work around this. And it's what I call the four note challenge. It's what I'm going to ask all of you to do. And uh, in a few minutes, ask Imogene Heap to do. The basic idea is this, that, that when presented with endless possibilities, creativity, I'll just make a piece. If you're anything like me, that, that becomes a very emotional moment. I, I, and every piece I want to write, one, I want to change the world. And I, I want to write about sorrow and joy and, and children and beauty and flowers, the, the, the glory of humanity. You get totally paralyzed in that moment. When, when anything is possible, nothing becomes possible. And the things that you want to say, at least the things I want to say, are, are profound. And there's, there's no two notes or three notes that can really capture that thing. So you find yourself writing a little bit and then stopping and just throwing it away. I don't know how else to go. I, I, so here's, here's what I found. With the four note challenge, you're trying to put the tightest possible shackles onto your creative process because it's when you, when you shackle yourself, when you build these, this very tight box around you, that's when you'll adapt and cleverly find your way out of it. And I think that what's happening is you're actually using a different part of your brain. You're moving the creative process from the emotional part of the brain to the problem solving part of the brain. And that's where genuine inspiration happens. So what I do when I, when I write any piece of music, I start with what I call the golden brick. The golden brick for me is it's a chord or a couple of notes that contain all the DNA for the piece that I'm about to write. The, maybe the most famous example of all is those four notes by Beethoven from the Fifth Symphony. If, if you listen to that, not only did he make an entire first movement based only on that, where he's just playing with those four notes over and over and over, he made four movements that are all cut from that same cloth. And I don't think it's coincidence that there are four movements and four notes in the motive. I think in a fractal kind of way, he's, he's using that material at the, the macro level and at the micro level. For me... Uh, and this is just for me, but uh, I'm, I'm an incredibly emotional person and I only write from an emotional place. I, I could never understand maybe the way Bach wrote where he seems to write just for the pure joy of music for music's sake. That's not to say he wasn't emotional or wasn't imbuing meaning in the music. But for me, it has to mean something. It has to mean something deep. And so, for instance, in a piece like Cloudburst, which is a piece that I wrote uh, back in 1992, it starts with this chord. It's very simple. And the choir sings la lluvia, which in Spanish means the rain. That for me, that collection of notes is my golden brick. And it's, it's almost impossible to articulate other than to say, that sounds like the feeling I have when I witness a cloudburst the sense of wonder and awe and innocence and rebirth somehow is all in that collection of notes. Now, I'm not sure that that works for everybody. I'm not sure everybody hears those, those notes and thinks of wonder and awe and the rain, but I know that it works for me. And that's my North Star. Once I've got that, it's like reaching into this other world and pulling out a little brick, this golden brick, 
that then I can start building this whole cathedral with. The thing is, once you start with something like that, or you've got that idea, you can really lose your path you, or you lose your way on the path. So how does that develop? What, what do I do with it? Um, where do I go from here? And the, the key is that in there is all of the building blocks for everything you're about to do. So you can take that golden brick and then break it apart. Take it away from the emotional part of your brain and go to a technical part of your brain. What happens if you break it up? Okay, interesting. What if you play it in random order? What happens if you change the key? Just play with it. What you want to do is just play with the material in this very objective, distanced way, just looking for patterns. And inevitably, you will find yourself, ba-boom, you find that connection, that amazing moment, and that leads you forward to the next decision, which leads you forward to the next decision, to the next decision. Um, this to me is the, the joy of the creative process. And that's where the true inspiration comes is those moments, moment, moment, moment. Now, something important to remember is when you're building one of these pieces, it's, I've never found it effective to start at the beginning and to write all the way to the end. In fact, what I do is I build kind of a, I draw on a piece of paper, what I call the emotional architecture, which is the whole journey, the emotional journey of that, that I want the piece to take. And then I'll work on different pieces of it. Okay, I know this will be the climax. So let's write the climax first. Now let's write the, the bit just after the opening. Let's write that now. How do those connect? Now let's do it, like kind of break it up and then start to see the pattern unfolding in front of you. So now with the four note challenge, what you're gonna do is train yourself to do this on a micro level so that when you get into these bigger compositions, you'll be able to do this at the macro level. The idea is, and this is what I'll do to, to uh, Imogene, I'm going to give her these four notes. You only want to use four notes. That's it. No more. This is important because you're, you're putting on the handcuffs as tight as you possibly can. What can you possibly do with four notes? In, for me, in the dream world, what, what a young or emerging composer would do is they would wake up in the morning, choose their four notes work all day on it. And by, the, by midnight that night, they would record it and upload it to Instagram. The reason you're going to upload it to Instagram is because you're going to make it a story and, or, or you're going to make it a post and it can only be one minute long on Instagram, right? Then your piece can only be a minute long, can only be four notes and has to be finished in a day. These are brutal and almost impossible conditions to write under, which means that you're going to make clever, creative, quick decisions. You're going to start building that muscle to, to find solutions uh, that you normally wouldn't find. You'll also really train your muscle to, to come to a moment when you think, maybe that's not the best idea I've ever had, but it's the best idea I've got now and I'm moving forward. And now that's the best idea I've got, I'm moving forward. Ultimately, that's what composition is, is finding your best idea you've got now and going. Now and going. It's a beautiful way to train it. And so if you've got those four notes, you can start to play with it. That can have an emotional connotation for you. You can hear that. You can change octaves. You can change. Maybe you, you know. What, what, whatever the thing is, you start to adapt. You get very clever. Again, I can't emphasize this enough that I say the word clever because that's the part of your brain you want to be using at this part in the, in the creative process. Not the emotional part, but that part, that, that, um, that crossword puzzle part of your mind. Then what will happen is you'll stumble up on connections to other parts of the piece. And that's where the true inspiration will happen. That's when you'll realize, oh my God, this is connected to this, is connected to this. There's my piece. That's how this all works together. And oftentimes what I'll do in, in a piece as I'm writing it, I'll have what I think is my, my golden brick. And then I'll realize, oh no, actually my golden brick is this. Through the process, I realize, which, and then the pieces like Tetris just all start to fall together. That's when you have that eureka moment. And, and that's what keeps you, <laughs> keeps you writing the next piece. Good luck with it. Um, uh, I know it's helped me so much. If you post by the way, to Instagram or to, to YouTube or to Facebook or anything, please tag me in it. Um, I'd love to see what you're doing as you do the four note challenge. 
And now let's let's go meet one of my absolute creative heroes, Imogene Heap, and see what she does with the four notes. Imogene Heap. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. How are you? It's, uh, it, I'm great. I'm all the better for speaking with you this morning. I think too often creativity is seen as you know, this wide open field to just do anything. Terrifying. And you and I both know that's paralyzing, actually. Yeah, that, absolutely that, awful. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I think each artist has to reckon with how do I shackle myself, or at the very least, how do I box in all of this so that I have some walls to push against? Yeah. And in my experience, the, the tighter the shackles, the more creative and clever one gets trying to work their way around the obstacles. Yeah. Well, that's the hope anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing about the four note challenge is that the idea is, is you're supposed to do it very quickly. Like yes, at the very right. most, you wake up in the morning, you start, and it must be done by midnight. That way, if it's yeah. a complete wipeout, the whole point yeah. is just to, to flex that muscle and learn to do this thing over and over. If, if you don't mind, yes. where are you exactly? I know you're at your, your house and in your home studio. Yes. Well, actually, technically, I'm not in the house. I'm in a barn that used to hold hay and rats predominantly living in here um, up until about, I don't know, seven years ago. Um, and then we cleared it out. Well, I did a little clearing, I have to be honest. Um, I think I was pregnant at the time. Um, and uh, we, you know, we revealed this uh, lovely space. And some people that work with me, uh, namely Jason, um, put together a little kitchen and a shower unit. And it's basically called the barn, and it's massive. Um, and it has a tree. Ha! Get ha! <laughs> you may notice it reacts to my voice. Um, so we have this huge tree. In fact, I'll just give you a little, shall I give you a, a please, whirl? Please. Yeah, a I might, not get, I might not get the camera in exactly the same position, but here we go. Okay. Da -da -da. Up we go, round and round. Ooh, there it is. There's the bar. It's the table tennis. There's a little. There is a Lexi. Oh, Unbelievable. Um, so yeah, it's this big thing. Um, actually, Alexi. Oh, wait a minute. See, that's what's going to happen. Alexi, if you can hear me, could you bring me a tissue, please? I need a tissue. Um, don't know if you can and, hear me. And so this this is where all of your albums happen, and and. Um, this Harry is Potter. where. No. Um, so the barn is where I I basically practice um, my live shows. I could do that here. We have a stage sometimes. Um, thank you very much. Um, we have a stage here that we can put in. And actually next week we're laying out some dance floor material and I'm going to do my first ever choreographed dance with some VR visuals that are going to be generated live with my gloves. Um, and then my friend Stephen Hoggett, who got me the job actually, actually mostly for the Harry Potter show, he's going to, he was the movement director and he's going to choreograph this piece, which is called The Last Night of an Empire, which was just released on my birthday about a month ago. Um, and I'll let you decide what that's about. Yeah, unbelievably timely. <laughs> um, so this is, yeah, this is the barn. And at the moment, it doesn't have a real piano in because it's blooming cold in here. Um, we have a heater above my head. Um, and I'm using, I've got two laptops. Uh, I've got one here, which has got um, Ableton software on it, which is what I use during my live shows, which is, you know, for those, I'm sure most people who are probably watching this know what it is, but it, you you can record sounds and use MIDI instrument VSTs um, and put on effects and stuff like that. Um, and then I also have a thing called Clever, um, which you could share if you wanted to right now, if you wanted to. Um, there it is, Clever. So Clever is the software that we designed uh, for the gloves, but they can also have different inputs. So you could also have, um, you know, Elite Motion, or you can also use um, any any OSC device, any anything that you might want to map to music, um, gesturally or not, or a light up collar, for example, I used uh, on my last tour. Um, and then within it, uh, I won't go into detail, but essentially you can you have your different postures. So I don't know if you can see. Yeah. So you've got this is my right hand. I've just highlighted. So when I close, there's a delay, but it's only because of the screen. It's not actually delayed. Um, open, close, puppet hand, one finger point, secret finger, T finger. Oh no, I haven't done T finger. Oh no, maybe I have. There you go. And then rock, rock sign. Um, so combinations of postures with movements. Um, so as you can see, this little area here. Um, this is my your 
sorry, that's, that's my, wait a minute, let me just set north. Oh, wait a minute, oh, that's a mistake. Um, da, da, da. So this is uh, my pitch. You can see that little ball going up and down. That's my yaw, my left and right, and then my roll, kind of like an aeroplane. And then I've got these hand arrows. That's basically accelerometer peaks so that I can play drums or I can make an action, move a different scene, um, you know, turn in an arpeggiator or whatever I wanted to do. And then in this area here, um, you, oh, and then I've got bend sensors. That's how that, that detects the postures. Um, and then over here, this is all the mapping. So I can put like button. So this is my first scene that I use. Um, I've got my button down. That's how I go back to zero, basically delete everything that I've just done so that I've got a fresh um, session. I can set forwards. Um, so that you're always you're my north or this is my north or wherever I want my north to be so that all the effects are relative to that zero point um, and then I can go to this oh there you go um, <laughs> that sounds strange um, so I'll just give you a quick example so I'm going to yeah. record my voice um, so at the moment I'm in this scene which enables me to reach just about anything um, so I can uh, go for example ah, oh I've got uh, I've got to bring in my vocals because I turned it off because of all the reverb. There we go. Now you've got my voice and lots of reverb. Um, so I'll go back to Glover. So just a very quick example uh, here. So this is my. So basically, if I you see this, it says fist. If I if I do my left fist, I record my voice, and you can see that mapped to overdub or play, and that responds to live here. There's a little looper you can see here, and you'll see that when I Move my gloves, my, my, oh. You can see. And when I pull my arm up, um, that's the, the, the volume, which is mapped to my left pitch. Uh, and uh, you can probably hear it moving left to right as well, because we're in stereo. Um, I can delete that just by literally putting my wrist down. Um, and then I could record something else. So it could be like... Uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to start again because that's just gone crazy. I can record a harmony. There we go. Um, and then over here, so that's my, my vocals. I could also, if I wanted to, um, I, could, I could go like Eric Whittaker. Still, Eric. Oh, wait a minute, that's a hard one. I'll just say Eric. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Let's try Imogen. 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 Not bad. Um, I got that trick from uh, Tim Exile. I stole that gag from Tim. Um, okay, and then so basically, I've got uh, hooked up here. I've also got my piano, and I've got my gloves so that I can also um, affect those. So, so when I put my arm out here, ooh, that's zero reverb. That's lots of reverb. Ah. Um, and when I want to reverse, I do that. I just do my fist. So, Okay, um, and then if I wanted to, I can just bring in, say, I wanted to bring in a doubler effect because every voice sounds better with a doubler. Um, so here we go. Ah, so I just do that by one finger point, one finger point down to zero. Ah, and then I've also got a thing if I'm my other hand. So I can I can sound very low. I could do bass lines. Oh, wait a minute, I have to go because it. It's very hard to demo with this one. So what I basically do with this setup, I improvise only with it. And um, I would like make a little beat or make a little vocal pattern or something or piano pattern. Oh, I need to go back into. And then that set the, the tempo. And then now I can hear a click if I wanted to. Um, and over here, Um, you can bring in my other page if you want. Um, okay, so this is endless. This is very cool. Um, okay, so for anyone even remotely interested in making music, you need to get this app. Okay, um, I didn't make the app, um, but I know the man who did, and he's a genius. So this is called Endless with three S's, and it's a social music making 
community. Um, thousands of people are using it now. It's only just, just been out. And now this is the desktop version. So you can basically have it on your iPhone, have it on your iPad, have it at home, on your laptop, wherever. And I use it all the time. In fact, I'm one of their top users because I'm literally on it every second I can. Um, so it's got drums. You've got drums here. I'm using this uh, push here, which is kind of you know, Ableton's push as a device controller device. So I can, I can choose between your drums. So you've got, so I'll just, um, I'll just do like a really crap loop. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. So that's my loop. Okay. So I've got a rubbish beat. Um, and then I might want to like add a bass line. So I'm going to hit my, well, that, that's not really a bass line. That's like, that's some thing. Um, some notey thing. And then I could record my voice uh, if I wanted in here as well. And then I can like, add effects. So I can go to effects. Oh, wait a minute. Effects is that one. And then I could choose my effects. So maybe I'll go for. Oh, I'll just go for an obvious, like, low pass. Oh, I need to select. I'm just learning this myself. Okay, so there's like a basic okay. low pass. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, I love it. It's great. And I'm using it all the time to make music really fast. And you can do it with your friends. And it's super fun. All right, I've um, got to say, so cool. <laughs> Anyway, I'm here for your challenge. Okay, um, so this is your setup. And, okay, this is my setup. And the idea as, as you do this, Emmy, which I think is effortless for you, but for, for everybody listening, is that there's no judgment as this unfolds, right? The idea Good. is you take your four notes. You already know that you're, you're hobbled at the beginning because you've only got four notes, right? So yeah. what can you possibly come up with with only four notes? So there's no pressure to come up with anything clever. It's just to simply start making and, and see where this all takes you, right? Okay. Yeah, okay, so... It. The, the four notes that I'm choosing right now, even at this moment, let's just, mm. uh, we'll start with the middle C. Okay. <sighs> yeah. Middle that, C, yes. <laughs> I could do middle so C. C. Yeah. Flat. Mid, yeah. Above. Then E flat. Okay, they're my four notes. Now, am I allowed to use octaves as well, or just those four notes? You absolutely can. You can use I don't any, mind. Any, any, any order in any, those are your four, that's your palette, right? So okay. do what you go with it. Okay, I got it. Okay, so I'm just basically going to get into the flow and that's see what happens. Great. Um, and maybe out of this, um, like what I'm starting to use endless in a way is by um, just jamming with it. And then you've got these things called uh, clips. So you can, or they're called riffs. And then you can flick between the riffs and you can really easily put it into Pro Tools, like all the separate tracks. Isn't oh, it? Sweet, sweet. Um, but I haven't got Pro Tools here, um, but I could do that later. So I could turn into something later. Okay. Um, but I will, I'll just see what happens. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, I am going to begin. Um, I'll begin by, so you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll at least set into C. So what would that be C minor? No, C. What would that be? C. Yeah, I guess you Dorian? could call it C, C Dorian. Minor. Yeah. Is it Dorian? Uh. Yeah, just a C minor natural, if if that's a choice there. I guess Dorian would be the same thing. C minor Aeolian. That would be it, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So let me just. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Some stuff is going to happen. <laughs> we shall see. Okay. Um, right. Okay, here we go. Okay, whatever comes to mind. Hmm, I just start. I just start wherever it starts. Um. Uh, 
foot looper is going to go to four bars. So this is a very slow beat, my goodness. Okay, here we go. I'm going to just record those bass lines. Live demos, it's so great. Oh yeah, I like it. What was it? 26 BPM or something? Crikey. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
no idea what the original tempo was. Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> oh my goodness, what was it? 20... <laughs> I was not expecting... This is great, this is great. It's <laughs> Something. So, so, always something. I mean, something. You, have, you have to know before, before you know, before the the crash, it, that was magical. I Thank swear, you. I was having an actual physical state change here. I was thinking, oh my goodness. this is the most uh, beautiful music. You please, please release whatever you just did. For eight minutes of that. I can't. It's not gone. Right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's very annoying. Um, yeah, because basically, uh, the first loop is whatever tempo. Um, and then I give us some weird tempo, like 29 point something, something. And I'm never going to find it. Um, well, I mean, I could, but I don't know if you want to. Should I start again? Should I do something else in no, the porno challenge? This is Finish? perfect, actually. Yeah, Amy. Okay. It's, it, it, okay. it perfectly illustrates what I was talking about, which is just this idea of, of okay. diving <laughs> at the pool, right? And, and just just playing with the notes. Um, it's, it's, I've said this to you before, but it is... Uh, it's otherworldly how you can take just a few musical gestures and turn them into something transcendent. I really know very few people who have that ability. It's, it's just magical. Oh, thanks. It's very kind. Uh, I mean, you did pick like my favorite key. <laughs> um, it's the key that I do everything in. So thank Me you. Too. I didn't, we didn't actually know that. Um, so here's another one. Uh, just a fun one. I don't know what else. So it's going to be something very different. <laughs> And not as pretty. Thank you. 
Amazing. 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 It's so good. It's so good. Amy, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you thank brilliant. You. I, I, I was sitting here like, about five minutes into that one and just thinking, I have a, a private concert with Imogene E right now. Regardless <laughs> <laughs> of what's happening, I can't believe this is my day, how this, this turned out really oh. nice. Well, this is, yeah, this is what I've been loving doing over the lockdown. It's exactly that. Just um, every Tuesday night, just uh, getting, just somebody giving me some limitations, actually. Often the fans just saying, right, Imogen, we want you to play with this BPM, with this kind of swing and these kind of chord progressions and with this mode. And I'm like, okay. And off I go. Um, and then I just get lost in it. And it's, it's really fun. So Tuesday nights, what, what time does that happen? Well, it's not happening every Tuesday night at the moment. It's a little uh, bit more difficult because of the lockdown. Um, but... I mean, I might start doing them again. It's just I was getting into using that one day um, where I have I am to myself um, to to make some music, and I've got this lovely song that I really want to finish. Um, 
it's really, really special, and I just haven't had the time to finish it. But if you want to hear it, I've got an app. You can go to imagingheap.app, yeah. and you can hear the working progress of all of these ideas. Amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so good to see you. Yeah, lovely to see you too, Eric. Be well. Well, Eric, that was pretty remarkable to watch you and Imogene do that magic with some pretty magical tools. She's unreal, isn't she? She's yeah. Unbelievable. And when do we have that experience of kind of looking over the shoulder of the creator and seeing, you know, the the tools that she's using uh, to manipulate sound and to make all those, you know, I mean, I was trained as a classical musician, but I hardly understand any of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, are you keeping up with all that technology too? It's less I'm, good with that, you know? Yeah, I'm trying, but I'll, I'll say that, I mean, watching imaging, she's literally inventing the tools that she's working with, right? Those gloves are hers. She invented those. So I, I'm only keeping up I, every time Imogene invents something, then I try to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. I have to say watching her do her thing. Uh, you said it best about sort of being a fly in the wall, of the creative process, which you don't often get to see. And I know very few artists like Imogene, maybe Jacob Collier is like this too, who are so vulnerable with their process that Imogene isn't afraid at all to just be herself, right? She's, like, oh, that didn't work. Oh, that was a disaster. Oh, that was great. That's nice. She just, it's its like a like a child in a sandbox. And that, that innocence and that that effervescence when she's creating, it's infectious. I, I get inspired every time I see her do her thing. Well, and I think that vulnerability we is really inspiring for us to see, right? That the, that the process is not like, look at me, I have this, right? You know, I have, I, I'm a genius, I'm creating, right? As opposed to, I have this need to create, I have these ideas, I have this impetus, you know, and that. So my, my first official question here, um, Eric, is my senses from knowing creators that, or people that are in the creative methodology or they're struggling to be more creative or they have at, you know I, I have a sense that it it has the perception and maybe it's a myth that that it's overwhelming that a creator can be just you know and I think what you've helped us understand is that that there that, that we have to engage in process as well as just just be creative right yeah that's it exactly that it I think it I know even myself that you're, you can be completely overwhelmed by creativity with a capital C and that actually the, the real, the real uh, juice of creativity comes in the details and it just comes in this Ravel said it best. He said that um, I'll be at my writing desk from eight to four every day. If inspiration wants me, she knows where to find me. I've always thought that sums the whole thing up, that actually it's it's just this quiet, focused, make a decision, go, make a decision, go, make a decision. The moment you think of creativity and possibility, you, you really get paralyzed and it can be truly overwhelming for, for anybody at any stage of writing. This happens to me all the time. It does happen to you all the time? All the time. This is one of the things that I loved watching Emmy do is that that it doesn't really matter how many pieces you've written or what kind of success you've had. Each new piece is a terror. You know, it's that, that, that white, that blank canvas that Stephen Sondheim talks about where mm -hmm. you sit down and you think, what am I doing? I have no idea what I'm doing. And, and it, it's, it's kind of reinventing it every single time. It, in fact, I'd say it, it gets even, at least for me, it gets more difficult the, the longer I do it, because then there becomes an expectation. You know, each new piece is, wow, what will this new piece be? People really want it to be this, this groundbreaking thing. And me at my little keyboard is thinking, what am I doing with my life? If I would have studied harder, I could have been an architect. You know, I could have had a real job. <laughs> I, I think that's so, that's so important to be revealed, right? You know, it's like, uh, because it's kind of the, the serious essence of it. Right. And that the human essence of it, um, you know, so, oh, she, oh, she's so creative. Look, it just falls out of her like it's like it's natural. And, you know, I woke up one morning and I, the song just came to you. I wrote it down and it sold 10, 10,000 co or 100,000 copies. Right. You know, it, it's kind of like it doesn't really work that way. Right. Not so, at all. And it's, it's funny no. because on my desktop, I actually have uh, images of Beethoven manuscripts. And I look at them all the time to remind myself that you hear Beethoven and you think, 
you know, you think this, this lofty, almost God, this Olympic God, uh, sending down this, this magic from the mountaintop. And actually you look at his manuscripts and you see, it's just endless writing and rewriting and struggle. He didn't, he couldn't find it. It wasn't easy. Sometimes he's scratching so hard with the quill that it goes through the paper itself. It's, it's a messy process. And even if you're Beethoven, it's that being said, I would encourage any composer out there to avoid manuscripts by Mozart because there's none of that. It just right. is what it is. And Mozart is, he's unique. He, he sits in this, this other world, but I think for everybody else, for, uh, it's, it's a very mortal, um, endeavor and it's a messy endeavor. Yeah. So I kind of see the, you know, the, the psychology of it, maybe that's not the right term, but you know, it's like in the creative process. So there, there is some inspiration, right? I mean, there is some, like some energy that, that pops up and says, go, right, or do, right? But it feels like that there's this ready set thing that, that we're ready set, you need to pull back and do a little bit of introspection and a little bit of discipline before you go, right? It's, like, the, it's the perfect way of describing it. Yeah, that, that I, think, I, I think that there's two kinds of inspiration. There's the lightning bolt inspiration, which doesn't come that often. And I've never personally had it happen where a piece just appears formed in my head. Generally, it's an idea or a path forward. Oh, for, like with the space piece, deep field. I had a concept and a basic shape of a piece. That's what the lightning bolt inspiration was. Then the true inspiration I find is those tiny decisions, one after another, after another. And the inspiration comes from starting to see the connection between these decisions that, oh, this is related to this, is related to this, is related to this. That's where that epiphany moment happens. And that's the, that's the kind of inspiration that keeps you rolling forward and making the thing. But it doesn't look like it does in the movies. You know, often <laughs> those moments are hard won. It's after four hours of scratching paper. And nothing, nothing looks like it does in the movies. Yeah, unfortunately. Except for Deep Field. <laughs> Except for Deep which is literally in the movies. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's so interesting because you know it's it's like uh, it's like sort of the Hollywood version of creativity, and then the, like the real version, the real version of creativity, you know. And I think that uh, you know the inspiration that many people feel to be creative, uh, great, but can do you have the stamina to do the hard work? Yeah, that's exactly right. The stamina and and. What I find pulls me forward through that because it, it, with each new decision, you can really despair and abandon a piece. I know this has happened to me countless times, but I've also talked to a bunch of emerging composers who say, I get an idea and I can't go on from there. And, and the thing that pulls one forward, I think, is using a different part of the mind, right? Like I was talking about before, that, that you want to remove yourself from this place of, of ecstatic inspiration, if you will, where you're overwhelmed emotionally and just go to make it, turn it into a crossword puzzle. How does this relate to this? What is the underlying principle that connects these two things? And the moment that part of your brain starts to deal with it, that's when the true magic happens. It's, so, uh, so the concept of the block is real. A writer's block or a creative block is real. Yeah. And, and it's also the one developing a technique or techniques to overcome the reality of the block. It, yeah. and in fact, I would say that composition is writer's block. It's just block and then decision, block, decision, block, decision, that mm -hmm. rarely ever you just get this running path of, oh, God, here's 35 bars in a row that all work, that, that the writer's block is, um, it's a very real thing, but it's also navigatable, that you can mm -hmm. work your way around it. You can, and, and sometimes use it to your advantage. It, yeah. it, it, it sometimes, it, it, especially if you find yourself really ramming your head up against the wall on something and you do it long enough, then eventually you realize, okay, I'm going the wrong direction. This is, a, this is good news because now I know that doesn't work. So after all this, Eric, my final question is, why the heck do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Eric. I mean, I myself that every morning. I mean, this is really, and this is a really intense human endeavor here, right? I mean, it's. I mean, you you've got to you have to live with yourself through this, and you have to live with, take care of other people, live with other people. But you know, this is this is kind of one of those existential questions. You know, and did it choose you, or it, or you chose it, right? I mean, it's 
let's face it, that is creativity too, right? It is, totally. And I, I guess I would say like, there, there is this, this, this ecstatic moment that happens when you've, you spent all these hours putting an idea, which and really music is more than just music. It's a, it's a world view. It's a philosophy that you've put onto a page and then you give this to other people. And then they somehow take this into their bodies and their hearts and their instruments, their souls, their minds, and they bring this thing to life. That moment that that happens, that's the reason that you keep doing it. It's, it's electrifying. And with that, I realize now I've just turned 51 and I realized that I didn't know that I was doing this, but that a lifetime of doing this over and over, this, this discipline of making a thing, struggling with it, listening to it, making it's actually transforming me as a person. I would be a different person now at 51 had I, had I not done this, had I not had this daily discipline year after year after year. And I'm grateful for the transformation. 20-year-old me never could have seen that. Um, but 51 year old me is, is truly grateful. Well, I want that to breathe a little bit because that's really important. So Eric Whitaker, we love you. Oh, thank you, Mary. It's the You're same. a great inspiration to us. You're so important to us. And I can't wait for you to be on that grand rally stage back oh. at the now show. We're going to have a gazillion people singing. Yes, I, we're gonna have flashlights. We're gonna have whatever. We're gonna have thunderbolts. Whatever it takes. Let's do it. I cannot wait. I really can't. I mean, fingers crossed. It's a year from now that we're all standing together, just breathing yeah. all over each other, hugging each other. Um, yeah, I really hope for that. I ache to be back with you and with everyone at Nam. Just, just doing what we do. And we will be. We will meet again. And to all of you in our audience, thank you so much. Never stop creating. Never uh, come back and watch this uh, episode to get your encouragement and to understand the value of your dedication and your discipline and all the things that you can bring to the world that the world needs. So thank you. Thank you, Eric Whitaker. Thank you, Mary. Thanks to NAM Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely.